Let's go on study. Potassium sparing diuretics. Weak diuretics. You first study a spironolactone. lactone. It also named antisterone because it is a competitive antagonist for the aldosterone receptor in the last segment of distal tubule and collecting duct. So it can block the aldosterone-dependent sodium potassium exchange. Finally, they increase the excretion of sodium ions on the water, while potassium ions is retained. So that's why they called potassium sparing diuretics. At the same time, because of a similar structure to the sex hormone, spironolactone has moderate antagonism of sex hormone. You know, they also compete to bind with the sex hormone receptors like progesterone receptor and androgen receptor. Its diuretic effects is really weak and slow because it is competitive antagonist of aldosterone receptor. So this diuretic effect by aldosterone anti uh, spironolactone, antisterone, it is affected by the level of aldosterone in the body. Because of potassium sparing diuretic effects, they usually use the in combination with cellulose diuretics and high ceiling diuretics. The result is they enhance the diuretic effects and decrease the loss of potassium ions. So try to avoid hypokalemia by that and high ceiling diuretics. Because of antagonism of aldosterone, this drug, compared with other potassium sparing diuretics, it is much useful. Now look at the therapeutic uses. The first one is this diuretic effect. It is often given in conjunction with a cell that or loop diuretics to prevent potassium excretion. Just now I mentioned, this is relatively commonly used. Second, it also used for the secondary hyperaldosteronism. You know, the page for some patients with relatively high level of aldosterone in the body, like hepatic cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome. You know, the patients with hepatic, uh, hepatic cirrhosis, usually they have complication of hepatic cirrhosis ascites. You know, this is a specific edema in this disease. And sometimes nephrotic syndrome, also the patients have relatively serious edema. So for these two conditions, use the spironolactone to relieve edema. It is much helpful. And in the treatment of heart failure, nowadays spironolactone, it also appeals many physicians' attention. Yeah. And uh, because actually for the patients with heart failure in their body, maybe they also has relatively higher activity of RAAS, you know. The last substance in this system is aldosterone. So in the treatment of chronic heart failure, spironolactone is very useful, especially as side it also has antiarrhythmic effect in the treatment of heart failure. So this is very useful. You will study this in detail when you study the drugs for the heart failure. You will study this drug again in that chapter. Next one, this drug also used to treat a resistant hypertension. You know, diuretic drugs also are commonly used to treat hypertension. But usually, some common patients with hypertension, we don't use a spironolactone. Just for some resistant hypertension, maybe spironolactone is helpful. 
using of three or more medications without reaching the blood pressure goal for these patients, maybe it is helpful. And this drug, it uh, is often used for the treatment of polycystic ovary syndrome because it block it can block androgen receptors and inhibits steroid synthesis at the high dose, thereby helping to offset increase the androgen levels seen in these disorders. Of course, its adverse effects, it is usually related to its potassium sparing diuretic effects and um, anti effect of sexual hormones. So, usually, they induce gastric upside, even induce ulcers, headache, drowsiness, mental disturbances, even hypokalemia in a long-term application. Because of higher affinity to progesterone on the androgen receptors, this drug may be induced gynecomastia, sexual disharmon, even women hirsutism due to its an antagonism of sexual hormone. Okay, amitarin um, and amylaride, these two agents also are potassium sparing diuretics. They have a relatively weak diuretics and the slow diuretics. Um, but different from spironolactone, they are not competitive antagonism. Uh, antagonist of aldosterone receptors. So their diuretic effect are not affected by the level of aldosterone because they just also act on the last segment of distal tubule and collecting duct by blockade of sodium transport channels to decrease sodium potassium exchange. So they just work as potassium sparing diuretics commonly used in combination with other diuretics, usually for their potassium sparing properties, different from spironolactone. Carbonic and hydrous inhibitors, like astazolamide. This drug acts on the proximal, proximal convoluted tubule, inhibit carbonic and hydrates. They have weak diuresis, and because of this diuretic effects, they also, because of inhibition of carbonic anhydrase, they can decrease the genesis of aqueous humor and cerebral spinal fluid and decrease the pH value of this body fluid. So the clinical publications of acetolomide include glaucoma, especially used to treat chronic open angle glaucoma and uh, prophylaxis of acute mountain sickness. But this is just a prevention for the acute mountain sickness. So if you want to climb high mountain, you know, you should administer this drug advanced one to five days before climbing mountains. Try to avoid some symptoms like fatigue, headache, or sleep less, or dizziness, like these symptoms caused by acute mountain sickness. It is helpful because of this decreased cerebral spinal fluid and decrease the pH value of this spinal, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. In the treatment glaucoma, this astazolamide it also is useful. Do you still remember? Till now, you have studied 
several different agents in the treatment of glaucoma. Do you still remember? Actually, here I give you a summary. They include palocarpine. You know, it is M receptor direct agonist, and fasostigamine, M receptor indirect agonist. You know, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, gut level epinephrine. It is adenomimetic drugs, and timolo beta receptor blockers. And uh, today you also studied carbonic anhydrase inhibitor astazolamide. And the next section I will teach you monitor osmotic diuretics. Yeah, these drugs are useful in the treatment of glaucoma based on different mechanism. Okay, just now you finished the studies of diuretics, including high setting diuretics, thiodides, you know, a sparing, uh, potassium sparing diuretics, and uh, carbonic anhydride inhibitors. They have a different characteristic of their diuretic effects. And so they have different clinical uses. They have different adverse effects. Try to remember this well. But uh, in this chapter, I also will teach you osmotic diuretics. Do you know them? How about their clinical uses? Let's go on. Osmotic diuretics include these agents, manitol, subitol, 50% hypertonic glucose, and glycerin and urea. Manitol it is the representative drug in this group. If the drugs work as osmotic, mass, um, osmotic diuretics, they must have the following characteristics. They are not easy to pass through capillaries, so just stay in the blood vessels to maintain osmotic pressure in the blood. And they are easy to be filtered, where glomeruli, so they can be excreted with urine but they are not easy to be reabsorbed by the renal tubules. And they are not be metabolized in the body. So after metabolism, maybe some drugs change its properties. So lose this effect to change osmotic pressure. So they should be not metabolized in the body. But you know, hypnotic a glucose can be used by the body, you know, as the energy. So they has relatively less effect of op osmotic diuretic effects than mentor. Okay, study mentor. You know, this drug, it is the representative drug of osmotic diuretics. So the first the pharmacological effects by mentor is dehydration, tertiary. Now look at this means a cell. This is interstitial space. This is blood vessels. After intravenous injection of mentor, because of its specific properties, mentor just stay in the blood vessels, and then increase plasma osmotic pressure rapidly. So based on this, this um, gradient of osmotic pressure, the water will move this direction, you know, from this inside of the cells and the inter interstitial spaces. And also based on this pressure gradients, they also enter the blood vessels. So cause the intracellular water to filter into interstitial space and circulation that entails tissue dehydration. This is the mechanism of its dehydration. 
And the second is direct effects. Because you know, after intravenous injection, the first increase circulatory blood volume and also increase glomerular filtration rate, indirectly reduce sodium chloride reabsorption. So decrease osmotic pressure in the medullary hypertonic area and decrease the reabsorption of water in the collecting duct. So it affects the condensing function of the kidney to the urine. So it has this diuretic effect. The therapeutic application of mandatone, it's because of its relatively rapid osmotic diuretic effect and dehydration. You know, it usually used to treat brain, brain edema and glaucoma yeah, because of tissue dehydration. Actually, in the treatment of brain edema, it is the first choice. First choice. Next one, it also used for prevention of acute renal failure because of its diuretic effects. You know, it can increase osmotic pressure of the renal tubular fluid and prevent water absorption to maintain enough urine volume and then dilute harmful substance in the renal tubules. You know, in the acute renal failure, maybe the urine production is very little. So there are so many high concentration of a substance, a metabolized substance. They will damage epithelial cells of the tubules, even lead to necrosis. So when using, using by using manitol can protect renal tubule against necrosis by the metabolized substances. Okay, this is very useful in the prevention of acute renal failure, many times. Of course, this drug increases the blood volume is so rapidly. And it often reduces some adverse effects because of higher blood volume, you know, it to in increase this blood volume very rapid, very rapidly. So maybe the patients will show headache, a vertigo, blur and vision, or palpitation, even osmotic nephrosis. So, you know, for the patient with chronic cardiac insufficiency, try not to use this drug because it can induce serious complication in, because of rapid increase of blood volume. So this is a contraindication for mental. Okay, that's for this section. Could you make a, a summary of therapeutic applications of diuretics? Actually, in this chapter, you study many agents. They have different therapeutic uses. OK, let's go on study. In this chapter, you studied many agents work as diuretics. They have different diuretic characteristics. So actually, they have different therapeutic applications. Now there is a summary for you. You know, edema is the common indication for the diuretics. And the edema usually occurs in different <coughs> tissue or organs. They have different symptoms. So diuretics just to relieve the symptoms caused by edema. And uh, it includes cardiogenic edema. You know, this edema caused by cardiac disease. Usually, it is congested to have failure. Now, the edema usually occurs in the lower limbs, like this picture show. To relieve edema, the diuretic drugs are the most effective. In the treatment of mild to moderate congested to have failure, usually say that. It is more important. But when it fails, or for the serious congestive heart failure, 
loop down radix is commonly used. But cautions, because these diuretics can decrease cardiac output and increase aldosterone, even induce hyperkalemia. So for the cardiac disease, these are the bad result. So actually, especially to avoid hyperkalemia, we usually use sedatives or loop diuretics in co-administration with spironolactone. You know, this is antisterone for the contrastive heart failure. Just now I mentioned it has a significance to prevent arrhythmia caused by heart failure. It's very useful, common used. Nephrogenic edema. This edema is occurs more frequently, uh, more frequent in the eyelid. It usually choose, uh, we usually choose furosemide to control this symptom of nephrotic syndrome. Usually also use the co-administration co with spironolactone and uh, with metalazone. Hepatogenic edema, you know, it is usually caused by hepatogenic hepatic cirrhosis. And ascites is a common complication of hepatic cirrhosis. So to relieve this edema, we usually choose sedat or loop diuretics in combination with antisterone. Because the body, in the body of the patients with this disease, aldosterone level is relatively higher than the other people. So antisterone is commonly used. In the treatment of, of acute pulmonary edema and the brain edema, actually, these edemas usually are emergency situations. So we require relatively rapid diuretic effects and powerful effect. So in the treatment of acute pulmonary edema, loop diuretics is the first choice. Usually we can inject furosemide intravenously. And not only because of their powerful and rapid diuretic effects, it also related to the effects on hemodynamics because you know, loop diuretics also can decrease the pulmonary congestion. That's why it is the first choice in the treatment of, of acute pulmonary edema. In the treatment of brain edema, medical, it is the first choice, you know, because of dehydration caused by medical, and uh, osmotic pressure increased by multitone decrease the cerebrospinal fluid production. So it is very useful to relieve brain edema by multitone. And at the same time, loop diuretics, it also is helpful in the treatment of brain edema. But it is not the first choice for brain edema. Okay. Hypertension. This uh, especially that are common used to treat hypertension. So uh, they are the basic antihypertensive drugs. It, uh, they, they are also one of basic antihypertensive drugs. In the chapter of antihypertensive drugs, you will study this drug again. And just for the some serious. Uh, hypertension crisis and loop diuretics are useful maybe and it's in the patients with some resistant hypertension spironolactone sometimes also is helpful but the common used agents are serotonin 
accelerating the elimination of some toxicants. You know, urine is the main way for the excretion of many substances, including some toxicants or drugs. Maybe some patients have toxication caused by some drugs or toxicants like bromine, iodine, or selenium. You know, diuretics of local diuretics. They are the first choice to promote the toxicants excretion with the urine because of their rapid and powerful diuretic effects. To treat diabetes insipidus, we just use a cell that because of its specific properties for the patients with diabetes insipidus. And in the treatment of idiopathic hyper calcium urea on the calcium stone, we also only use cellulite to promote the reabsorption of calcium and facilitate sodium-calcium exchange in the prostate, prostate distal tubule, you know, decrease the calcium concentration in the urine. It is very useful. But in the treatment of hypercalcemia, uh, calcemia, which is loop diuretics, because only loop diuretics can decrease the reabsorption of calcium and promote the excretion of calcium. So decrease the concentration of calcium in the blood, it is helpful. Okay, now you finished the study of this chapter. This figure, it also is a summary about the drug mechanisms so I think it also is helpful to review, help you to review this knowledge. Okay, that's all of this chapter. To help you review this chapter, I also give you several questions. You know, the classification of the drugs, including representative drugs in each group, and their um, site of action, you know, you should know well, and uh, including the adverse effects of loop diuretics and cell deaths. They are also more important, and uh, you also should know well the therapeutic if applications of diuretics, including mannitol. Okay, that's all for this chapter. Bye.